This episode of the Far Bank Fly Fishing School series focuses on the versatility and effectiveness of fishing out of a drift boat. Fly fishing out of a drift boat requires a unique range of skills and techniques that the wading angler doesn't utilize, but is a highly effective way of covering a lot of water and can result in a lot of fish caught. So let's push this episode out in the water and look at some of the best ways of optimizing your day in a drift boat. So first thing is, what is a drift boat? Well, a drift boat, as the name suggests, drifts down the river. Usually they don't have engines, usually they're on sticks, on oars. It can be a hard-sided drift boat, it can be a rubber raft type of drift boat, it can be some kind of pontoon thing. But the essential thing about a drift boat is you're either gonna utilize it as a Uber type taxi type thing, where you get in and you go down to a particular pool, then you get out and you fish from the bank on that pool and you fish whatever technique you like, and then you jump in and row down to the next one. But really the technical fishing skills of a drift boat is fishing out of the drift boat. And what would happen is you'd, you'd put a boat in an X and you fish your way down, somebody's rowing the boat and you fish your way down for 10 or 12 miles or six or eight miles, but you're staying in the boat most of the time. And the person on the oars is rowing and their skill is to try and keep you within casting distance of the bank. So if you only cast 20 feet, their skill is to make sure you stay about 20 feet from the bank. And if you can cast a bit further, they might keep you 30 feet out from the bank. That's one of the skills of the person on the oars. Now, the drift boat, it's a boat, you're in water, things can go wrong, things can, can, can you know, unfortunately, things can happen. So you really do wanna be safe in a drift boat. And what that means is always have your life jackets with you, one per person. In some states that actually is the law, you can't even go out without them. But even if there's not the law, it makes sense to have a life jacket in the boat for every angler. You could wear them, they get a bit bulky and in the way. So if you don't really wanna wear them, that's up to you, but definitely wanna have your drift boat with your life jackets for every angler in there. I wouldn't stand in a drift boat particularly either. If you're standing up and the boat is going down and it hits a rock, you could easily fall in and, and that's not a good day. Um, but drift boats do have ways of standing in them. And when you look at the kind of components of a drift boat, you have the back end, the end that faces upstream, that's the anchored end the stern end, if you like, the rower faces downstream, looking where they're rowing so they can see, pulling backwards away. Um, and then you could be at the back end, that squarey end, the stern where the anchor is. But equally, you can be in the front end, the, the bow end, the pointy bit. If you're a one angler, you're almost always gonna be on your own in that front end of the boat. And if there's two anglers, you're gonna have one end each end, and the guy rowing is gonna be in the center, just keeping control of you. As I said, you could drift down, and really this whole episode is about fishing out of the drift boat, right? If you just use the drift boat as a taxi and just float down to a gravel bar and swing soft tackles, there's no point in talking about that. But what we're gonna look at here, in particular, is the various ways you can fish out of a drift boat. And why you don't need particular gear to drift out, fish out of a drift boat, a couple of things will make your day in a drift boat a little bit easier. And we're gonna take a look at that in the very next chapter. As I said, you don't need any specialized gear at all to fish successfully out of a drift boat. You can take your six weight rod for streamers and you can take your six weight rod and if you're fishing big terrestrials, that's a good call. A five weight rod's gonna be good with larger dry flies, maybe an infant indicator and perhaps a four weight rod if you fish soft tackles and smaller dries. Not really different from any other regular river fishing technique. Lines are the same. Perhaps the only difference I would suggest you consider is that the way you fish out of a drift boat, you're in the boat casting to the bank, generally speaking. You're making 20 foot casts, maybe 25 foot casts. Your fly lands, if it's a streamer, you're gonna make three strips and you're gonna pick it out and bang it back straight to the bank again. Short, quick casts is the order of the day. So when you do that, your fly line's gonna play a bit more of a role than a regular fly line. If you're fishing streamers, this is a line called a streamer tip, the streamer tip is a line that's weighted at the front. It's got a short front taper. It's designed exactly for throwing that. Big streamers, short range, bing, 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 quick strip, pick it up, back to the bank again. So if you're fishing streamers, I would look for a streamer tip type line or something that's gonna throw them. But perhaps the one outfit that's really different is gonna be when you fish terrestrials. And I think, you know, I think terrestrials are pretty fun. What terrestrials are, this is my little box of terrestrials, Terrestrials in the real world are land-borne insects that fall on the water. Could be ants and beetles, 
could be big things like grasshoppers and could be stoneflies, so they're just big flies. And you can see some of these are really large, these are stonefly type patterns, and I've got some grasshoppery type things down here. So one of the most enjoyable ways of fishing out of a drift boat when the bugs are around is to fish terrestrials. You cast them as close to the bank as possible. That's essential because the bug falls in the water at the bank. And you make this line land with a plop, and the fish hear the plop and come up and grab it. And you get this giant swoosh and boil, like a toilet flushing. So terrestrials is tremendous fun, really, really cool way of fishing out of a drift boat because you're covering a lot of bank all the time. And if you do fish terrestrials, kind of like the streamer line, make sure you get a line that is front loaded. This is the predator we have at Rio. We have a line called a bank robber. Both those lines are designed to cast big flies short range to the bank. So that is perhaps the only way I would set up slightly different from my regular outfits. In addition to that, in addition to your rod reels and lines, your leader, your tippet and flies, those are all the same. Perhaps a couple of other really good things to have in the boat. I would definitely take a nice boat bag, get a little boat bag like this. You can stuff in lots of gear and it's not going to be catching on you. It's not going to be you're wearing bags and fanny packs or fishing vests and things like that where things get in the way. You don't need it. You're in the boat all the time. So if you have a nice boat bag, you can stick in eight or 10 boxes of flies, you can stick in five or six reels and lines, you can stick in your sandwiches and you know a whole bunch of things and you keep it handy in the bag. So a boat bag is really a good thing to have. Keeps everything there and easy to transport. And then perhaps the only other thing I'd suggest, if your guide doesn't have one, if you're going out on your own or with a buddy and you wanna make sure you have a good little landing net, make sure the net's got a much longer handle than the standard net you wade with. When you're wading and the net's clipped to your back or in your fanny pack, you can just pick it up and reach a fish that's coming close to you. That's easy. But when you've got a drift boat, you've got these high sides, you've got to reach over, so you definitely want a net with a slightly longer handle. But other than that, as I said, you don't really need much in the way of specialty gear. And the way you fish out of drift boats, well, you're going to set up a bunch of rigs. You might be fishing terrestrials and streamers and, and dry flies and things like that. And we're going to take a look at some of the basic rigs you use out of a drift boat in the very next chapter. Just like the outfits that you use in a drift boat, the rigs you set up are very little difference between wade fishing and drift boat fishing. You're probably gonna fish streamers and you're probably gonna fish terrestrials, hopefully you can, that's the most fun. You might fish hopper dropper rigs or nymph rigs where you're drifting down. The first two rigs require chucking it out there, fairly large flies, so here's a streamer rig, for example, I've got on here, got a nice single streamer. I would chuck that as close to the bank as possible, make three or four strips, and then pick it up and throw it back to the bank again. One of the cruxes of that when you're throwing such big flies is really important to have the right type of leader. We talked about the fly line earlier, but also the right type of leader. You want a fairly short leader, something around six foot long is ideal. You don't want anything much longer than six foot. Nice short leader. But also you want it out of a medium stiff nylon, not a really supple, material that's going to waft and move in the water. You want the stiffness to turn over those big flies. So for me, a really good streamer leader, something like this big nasty six foot long. And that leader I would also use if I'm fishing big terrestrials. Right? They perform the same way as big streamers. They're air resistance, there's a lot of drag, and, and they also need short leaders, aggressive leaders, medium stiff nylons, not regular nylons. So if you're fishing terrestrials or streamers, you want these short, medium stiff monofills and you're going to be ideal with that. Outside of that, the other two ways you're probably going to fish out of a drift boat is the hopper dropper. The hopper dropper is that wonderful little setup where you can tie on something, a big dry fly, a nice terrestrial like this dry fly. Tie that on the end of your leader and then to the hook bend, you tie a, you know, a couple of feet of tippet material and hanging down there is a little weighted nymph. And this floats down the current seam with you in the boat as you're drifting down, you're fishing all the seams and the edges and this is drifting down and you've got two flies there and the fish could quite easily take your nymph, pull your dry fly under, but also expect the eat. With a terrestrial like this, you might get a fish come up and eat the dry fly. So you can fish a, a little hopper dropper technique like that. That's really a successful way of fishing out of drift boats. And then of course, if you're a nymph angler and you want to just really maximize your, probably your fish catching rate, you should probably rig up a nymph outfit. And again, no real difference from wade fishing to drift boat fishing. I'm gonna put my indicator on. Below that indicator, I'm gonna have a little tippet ring with a weighted nymph hanging down. And then below that, I'm gonna have a second nymph if I'm allowed. And I'll probably have, 
I don't know, maybe a foot to a foot and a half between the indicator and the first fly, and then a couple of feet down to the next fly. So again, really not that much different from wade fishing. Things are going to do get different when you fish them, how you fish them, and they particularly get different when you're casting in a boat, because there's a few things you've got to take care of when you're casting in a boat. We'll take a look at that in the very next chapter. Here we are on the beautiful Yellowstone River in Montana. We're going to get in the drift boat, fish our way down, and show you a few tips and techniques for fishing out of a drift boat. Perhaps one of the most important things you should learn before you get in a drift boat is some of the key differences that your casting styles are going to have to take on because you're fishing out of a drift boat. And there's really a couple of different things. One, you're going to be fishing in the front of the boat, or you could be in the back of the boat. Your buddy's rowing or your guide is rowing, and if you're in the front of the boat, you're going to require certain casting disciplines and skills and considerations to when you're fishing out of the back of the boat. And we will take a look at those in a further chapter, but keep that in mind, front or back. When you're in the boat, there's three really essential skills to master, and that is you want to control your distance, perhaps more than anything, and perhaps the hardest thing for most anglers to get into is mastering the distance control. Your drift boat with a good rower is going to position themselves, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 feet from the bank. You're going to make a cast, and you're going to fish that fly whatever way it is, and then move down, and your next cast might be 25 feet, and your next cast might only be 20 feet because the boat getting in or the bank narrows in. So controlling distance is essential. If you're too short, you're going to catch less fish. You want to be close to the bank. And if you're too long, you're going to snag the bank every time. And then the guy's going to row ashore and get really angry because all you're doing is rowing ashore and breaking off your fly or unhooking the fly. So distance control really is an essential thing for you to master for fishing out of drift boats. To a similar degree, accuracy is important. As you're drifting down, the boat's always going to be moving and you're looking ahead and you're trying to find the spot where you're going to cast the fly might be behind a boulder, it might be a current seam, it might be behind a branch, but you're going to have these little windows where you're going to have your fly and put, put the fly in. And again, by being accurate, that's going to improve your day and improve your catch rate. So your accuracy is a pretty important one to control and get the hang of. And maybe even more important than that is the speed of casting. Because you're going to have very little time on the river. The boat's constantly moving. You're going to have maybe one or two seconds or three seconds before you drift past the fish or the target area. So don't take five or six false casts. You're literally going to make one cast. Pick up, lay it down, pick up, lay it down. So you want to get used to your speed of your casting, your speed of picking up and speed of putting it down. So those are your skills. Those are your disciplines that you have. And then other things you should develop to be successful in a drift boat is you will never want to cast over the rower. Believe me, if you hit your rower, they aren't going to want to take you to any good water, and so you don't want to cast over your rower. And generally, let's say you're a right-handed cast like me, and you're casting right-handed, and then you switch the bank where now you have to cast over the rower with your right hand. Well, don't do that. You either want to switch hands and cast left-handed. That's a good discipline to master. You could also cast right-handed over your left shoulder like this. That's a backhanded style of casting. But some people also like to kind of turn and let their back cast go down and fish that way. It doesn't really matter what you do. You just want to develop a casting skill that gives you the opportunity to cast on the other side of your body, just so you don't hook the person rowing your boat for you. And then the final thing you probably want to get used to is when you're in a drift boat, you might be standing in what's called a knee brace. These are braces in the boats that kind of keep you upright. They keep you supported. So if you hit a rock or a current seam or the wind puffs, you don't fall in and drown. That's also probably an important thing to do. But you'll be standing in knee braces and that gives you a little bit of an odd body angle. That takes a little bit of practice for some people. Other people like to fish in a drift boat sitting down. And again, most of the time, most fly fishers fly fish standing up, wading or on the shore or on the flats. So sitting down is a new skill for a lot of people when they fish out of a drift boat for the first time. So these are just observations, things that will improve your casting and your fishing day and the fishing out of a drift boat. Once you've got those ideas of casting and those skills needed to be a good angler, well, then you've got to go down the river and fish the techniques. And we're going to take a look at that in the very next chapter. So let's take a look at some of the fishing techniques you would employ fishing out of a drift boat. And to be honest, when you're fishing in a river, you could be fishing all your normal techniques that you love. Are you a dry fly angler? Are you a nymph? Are you a streamer fisherman? Whatever angling technique you really enjoy, you can certainly do in a drift boat. But there's a couple of observations about that. Things to be aware of, like dry fly fishing. 
dry fly fishing, you never want a three second cast and gone and your opportunity is missed. So dry flying out of a drift boat generally falls to the person in the front of the drift boat, like Reagan here, front of the drift boat. She's got the casting section. She's got the area to aim up. She's going to be casting at the dry flies. And that's going to be ideal. So dry fly is one thing. When you do that, the difference is the dry fly, the boat will be anchored because you're going to need several casts. You're going to need five or six casts or 10 or 12 casts or maybe even change the fly. So in those situations, the drift boat actually might well just be anchored up and you're fishing the dry fly. For the other techniques, the dry fly alone anchored, the other techniques, the boat is just going to be moving, constantly moving down. And you might be fishing streamers because you like fishing streamers. One of the keys to fishing streamers is you're going to land a streamer close to the bank. You're going to rig up your favorite streamer outfit. You probably want a sink tip type line to get down because you want that fly to pitch down deep to the fish straight away. So you might be doing that. But your technique is going to be throw the streamer to the bank, a couple of strips, pick it up, do it again. You don't really want to pull the streamer all the way back to the boat because you're wasting time and you're not hitting that valuable water that is from the bank out for about 10 or 12 feet. So you're literally only stripping in 10 or 12 feet of line, making the next quick cast, popping it into the next spot where there's probably going to be a fish lying. That's streamer fishing. If you like streamer fishing, fabulous way of fishing out of a drift boat. One way that is different, nymph for an indicator, if you like to fish nymphs and indicators, you rig up your favorite nymph, favorite indicator outfit. And what's going to happen with nymph and indicator is the drift boat is going to put you on a nice little seam. The guy or girl on the oars is going to put you on a nice little seam and you're going to throw your nymph and indicator into that seam. And you might drift a hundred yards and do nothing. And you might just be watching that indicator going down and you're drifting a hundred yards. The indicator's keeping level with the boat. So that's easy. You don't have to recast. You don't have to make these quick decisions of where to cast to the bank because literally you're just floating down and the indicator's floating with you. That's about as easy as fishing can be. You can even make really short casts five feet from the boat and drift down next to it and you're going to catch a lot of fish. So that's a very successful technique, fishing out of a drift boat. But in addition to that, other ones that are really fun, terrestrials, I love fishing terrestrials out of a drift boat. Terrestrials are basically insects born on the land. So a grasshopper is a good example. It's summertime here, there's grasshoppers in the grass. Grasshoppers might just blow or fall into the water. And guess where they land? They're gonna land right by the bank. So if you fish terrestrials, you're gonna put on a grasshopper in the summertime. You might put on a big stone fly in a kind of spring, early summertime when the stone flies, whatever's hatching, whatever's about. But the crux of terrestrial fishing is two things. One, land a fly with a splat. The fish will hear that. They're waiting for that bug looking around and they sense and feel that splat and they'll go and investigate. So you don't need no gentle presentation here, but two, land it as close to the bank as you possibly can. Terrestrial fishing, you'll double your success rate if you can get within less than three feet of the bank. Or in other words, you'll halve your success rate if your terrestrial is landing five or six feet out from the bank. That's not where the fish are lying and waiting for terrestrials. I love that, it's a visual, it's exciting, it's a big fish general, big eat, very obvious thing. So a lot of fun fishing terrestrials. And then the last way I, I would fish is hopper and dropper, where you have a dry fly as a kind of a, some kind of dropper and hanging down from a nymph. And you could fish that either way. You can fish it as a nymph and indicator, floating down a seam, chucking the dry fly into that seam with the nymph under and just drift down 30, 40, 70, 80 feet. You could do that. But equally, it's also successful fishing it to the bank. You've got the terrestrial landing by the bank, which the fish might eat. And you've also got a little nymph landing in that seam. And you're having these few, like three, four, five second shots in these pockets where you think the fish are. Again, not really different from wading, just the fact that you've got to dip, bear this in mind and these variations when you're out in a drift boat. And once you've got the idea and you dial in the kind of style you want, well, you're gonna fish slightly different in the front of the boat or the back of the boat. So that's what we need to take a look at now. What are the key things you need to remember and know when you're fishing out of the front of a drift boat? There's a couple of observations, a couple of things to think about when you're fishing in the boat. If you're fishing in the front of the boat, the front of the boat is the end that's going downstream in the front, like leading, and the back of the boat's the end upstream, generally speaking, where the anchor is. And when you're in the front of the boat, you're probably in a good privileged position. There's a couple of things, as I said. Perhaps the most important skill of all, as simple as it sounds, is look ahead. The boat doesn't stop. 
So if you just kind of focusing on the bank right level with the, the boat, basically you're going to see the target. You're going to find this beautiful little bucket or this perfect current seam, and there it is, and it's passed it and you've missed it. So you should always be focusing on looking ahead. Look well ahead, keep your eyes in front of you. What's coming up? Where's that seam? Where's that drop off? Where's that rock? Where's that fish going to be? Look ahead, be prepared. When you get to that seam or that bucket, whatever it is, cast it. That's really important. Perhaps the number one skill of a boat angle is keep focusing on looking ahead. The second one is to avoid tangles, to avoid frustrations, to avoid annoying the person behind you, your mate in the back of the boat, is your general rule of thumb is you want to make sure your fly doesn't pass the oars. And that means that as the boat's drifting down, it's very easy to try and fish that seam a little longer, a little longer. There's that seam, there's a big trout, you can see it. And unfortunately, when it gets level with the oars, that's the person in the back of the boat's fish. That's their turn to take it up, your turn to leave it. So generally don't fish or don't cast upstream of where the oars are on the boat, that's another good one. And then as I said earlier on, you hopefully you develop your casting skills to cast off your other side of the body. So when you're fishing, if you're a right-handed caster, and you're fishing on the left side of the river, you'll be nice because you'll be casting right-handed, as you can see here. That's a normal, perfect casting technique to the right side on the left side of the river. But when you're fishing to the right side of the river, the one arm that is not casting over the row is your left arm. And in those cases, you're either going to cast left-handed or backhanded or do some back casts. So those are your three simple skills. Look in front, don't pass the oars, and make sure you can cast with your non-dominant hand for those situations where you have to cast over the rower. And it's pretty similar for when you're in the back of the boat. So let's take a look at that in the very next chapter. Fishing out of the back of the boat is not really different from the front. You've got the same basic rules of thumb, the three, one of them, look ahead. Look ahead for good water. But I think perhaps the biggest skill, the one that a lot of anglers miss, is you also kind of look at where the front person is casting. Let's say there's a little rock creating a seam, and you see they cast their fly in that seam, and they make two casts, and they haven't caught a fish. Well, why would you cast in that same seam when it's in front of you? So kind of try and pay attention to where they're fishing as well as what's coming up, and try not fish exactly the same pockets every time that they're fishing. Your chances go down. Try and fish the fresh water, they miss out. So look ahead, same rule, but for slightly different reasons. Equally, don't cast past the oars. That rule applies here in the back of the boat. I don't want to cast in front because I'm poaching that person's water in front. That's their territory till they pass. I like the back of the boat because you get more opportunity. Once you get oars level, I can make one cast there and fish it. I can make a second cast and I can make a third cast upstream and a fourth cast upstream. You get a little bit more time to hit those spots. So for me, I like the back of the boat. It's a little more technical and difficult, but I get a little more opportunities to cast at those spots if I miss them out than you do in the front of the boat. And again, like it is in the front of the boat, try not cast over the rower. When the boat's going down on the right side, the angler in the back has their right hand open. You should be casting right-handed. Lovely. But when the boat's on the left side of the river going down, the right hand is going to be casting over the rower. So just as it is in the front of the boat, don't cast over the rower. Switch hands or cast backhanded, just to be politically correct. Don't hook your rower. But in addition to those things, there's a couple of other little tips. One, avoid tangles. If you're in the back of the boat, you are the person who can see the angler in front. They can't see you. They don't know when you pick up and cast. So the person in the front of the boat can really just cast whenever they like. And it's up to you if you're in the back of the boat to understand when they cast. And if you see them cast, well, look, what you don't want to do is make a cast because that's going to result in the tangles. Don't cross the streams. Don't cross the fly lines. So that will tangle up. So avoid that. Keep your eye on it. If it looks like they're coming up to a spot to make a cast, either you don't cast or you have to do a little side cast or something that's going to avoid the tangling. That's really important. And then the only other thing I think perhaps in the back of the boat that's worth considering is there's a thing called an anchor. And that anchor is a real problem because the anchor has a bracket, it has something there that might tangle, the fly line might wrap around it, and that isn't something to be observant of. It's not going to happen all the time, you just want to be aware that the anchor could create a problem, and that is something to be aware of when you're in the back of the boat. And that's really it. That's all there is in the, in the boat, whether you're in the front or the back of the boat. There's some fishing skills, there's some casting skills. But the one thing we haven't touched on is what happens if you want to be the rower? What happens if that is your day to row? 
So what we'll do in the very next chapter is take a look at some of the skills and thought processes you need to know when you're rowing a drift boat. So it's finally your turn. Maybe you've never fished out of a drift boat before and you've fished in the front and finally it's your turn to get on the drift boat. And what are the things you need to know? Well, one, it is your job as the rower to help your anglers catch fish. And that means when you're in good fishing area, you want to dip your oars in, row back, and you're trying to hold the boat on station or giving them enough chance to make two or three casts to this spot where the fish are. So that's where you're dipping in and you're pulling the boat backwards, effectively trying to row upstream, but you're holding the boat to give your anglers as much chance of catching a fish as possible. That's quite a skill to have, but it's a good one to develop and know about. But equally, it's also when you get these long sections of water where there's no fish, there's no current, there's no structure, and it's not a really good fishy area, just blow past those. Either keep facing and push, push the oars downstream. You see Kurt's pushing the oars down here, rowing the boat downriver. Or if it's a long stretch, it's quicker to spin the boat around and row downstream with the current and pull. You get more speed and you'll blow past that non-fishy water much quicker by doing that. So remember to pull to hold fish and to push past the non-good fishing areas. Spend most of your time fishing the areas where you're likely to catch fish, or at least your anglers. Safety is really important. A couple of simple tips. Generally, you don't want to stand in the boat when you're rowing and, and fishing just freestyle because you might hit a rock or a puff of wind might knock you in. So generally, you want to be sitting down or on a knee brace. Certainly as a rower, you're going to be sitting down most of the time. Do have your life jackets with you. Check your regulations. Some waters say you have to have your life jackets on when you're in the water. So if that's the case, you've got to wear your life jackets. And as a rower, perhaps the most difficult discipline to understand is the comprehension of facing danger. And danger might be a, a root wad, it might be a, a strong wave train, it might be a huge rock. Turn the front of the boat to face danger and pull away. It's the most important safety tip. I've been in boats where people see the danger and they try to push, they try to push past it and you don't have enough strength, the current's with you and you're invariably going to hit the problem, the rock or the wave train or, or the root wad. So whenever you see something up ahead of you that's kind of dangerous, turn the front of the boat to face that danger, pull hard away and get away from that danger rather than push. Very important safety tip. Another couple of good tips. One, understand where your takeout is. Right? The last thing you want to be doing is you're having a great day with your buddies, you're rowing down, having a laugh and a giggle, and you look up and go, oh, there's my car and there's the takeout, and you've just drifted past it because you've got a long row down probably to the next takeout, or how do you get your boat back to that one? So know where the takeout is, know which side of the river it's on, that's really important. Also, if you've never done that float before, hopefully a car's there, you've arranged a shuttle, but also Pick a landmark. You can see a hill or a particular type of tree or a fence line or something that as you're getting down and coming towards that, you get an understanding of where the takeout is and make sure you're on the correct side of the takeout. And also you've taken a look at the takeout to know of any particular current seams that might make taking out difficult. So do your homework, especially if it's a new float for you for the first time. That's a really good observation and a good skill to have if you're on the oars. Another good skill to have is, is what's called the crab stroke when you're rowing. And you can see Kurt here. This is a very, very good technique. Kurt has got his one oar sticking out and one oar parallel to the boat. And what that is is a crab stroke. And what that does is it makes the boat move more directly sideways than up and down the river. So if you're coming up on fish or you're trying to adjust your target line to get a better angle of drift, this crab stroke is very unusual. It's very different from your regular stroke because you don't have two oars sticking out either side, but it's an excellent stroke to develop, particularly as you're getting to those finer points where you're targeting specific fish or specific floats. So crab stroke, developed from both sides of the body, that's a really good useful technique to have. And then really the last thing I'd suggest is to think about the anchor. Again, if you're new to drift boating and you're new to rowing a drift boat and you don't really understand what to do with the anchor, a couple of things. We're going to anchor because, one, you might be stopping for lunch at a gravel bar. You might be getting out of the gravel bar to fish. You're going to put an anchor down. You might be finding a pod of rising fish and you want to anchor the boat up in front of those rising fish so that the angler in the front of the boat has the time and opportunity to cast to them. Well, it, you most certainly don't want to just pull up the anchor and drop it with a big splash and a big noise. That's going to scare those fish. So let the anchor down gently. 
That's a great rule of thumb. Quietly. Also, when the anchor touches bottom, don't have your anchor vertically down. There is no way that's going to hold the boat. The boat will drag the anchor and drift downstream. Particularly if you're going to get out of the boat, when your body weight gets out of the boat, the boat rises. So if you have a short anchor, it lifts, the anchor lifts off the bottom, and then suddenly you're there peeing on the bank and, oh, where's my boat? It's gone downstream. So you've got to have enough anchor rope. Make sure that happens. Let out enough so that the anchor holds the boat where you want to. But if you're in a strong current, don't let out a lot of anchor rope. If you have 30, 40, or 50 feet of anchor, what's going to happen is you're so far away from the anchor stability, your boat is going to yaw sideways like this and make it very hard for the angler to control where they are fishing because they're yawing side to side. And really, that's all you need to know as the rower. So you want to make sure you know how to row past the fish, hold the boat when the fish are there, but row past the dead water. You absolutely want to know your safety skills. You want to make sure your boat's facing the danger and pull away. Got to know that. You also want to know where your takeouts are, right? Make sure you know your takeouts. Make sure you've developed these crab skills and things like that so you've got ways of increasing the odds of your anglers catching fish and understand the significance of anchor and how to put the anchor down. And really, once you've got all those skills, you're certainly good enough to get in a boat and row a drift boat. So there you have it, an array of fishing techniques, observations and skills that you can use to increase your chances of success when fly fishing out of a drift boat. I love how a day in a boat allows you to cover so much more water, to see ever-changing scenery and how being observant and quick-minded will result in more fish to the net. And I hope that some of the skills presented in this episode will make you more successful on your next float trip. As always, I want to end this episode with a friendly reminder to do your part in keeping the river clean and the fish healthy. Look after the environment, leave no trace of your visit to the water, and please treat the fish you catch with the utmost respect. Thanks a lot for watching this episode, and I hope to see you one day floating down the river, putting your newfound skills to great use.